Well the first time I seen Banjo I was picking up his big half-brother, Koi's Slapjack. I didn't pay him much attention outside of the fact that he was a pretty little son of a bitch. I don't think Joe Hoskins offered me a chance at him then. That was before Sack had quit in the match against Bo Wells and Bobby Hall. Well after I had looked at Slapjack, and a couple of weeks after Sack had quit on A.W. McCool. Me and a friend of mine named Timothy Hanna had returned to Joe Hoskins' house to buy a litter made to Slapjack. That was Betty Joe's first litter bred to McCool's bully. Well Timmy had never even been to a match. He was at my house when I was looking at Slapjack and wanted to get in the dogs. I was pretty broke at the time. So I invited him to go in as a silent partner on the other brother to Slapjack. He agreed so I called Joe and made the deal for Choppa for $400. He was a cold dog. I told Timmy that was cheap for a nearly 3 year old dog. But it was also a gamble that I could get him started. So the next weekend we went up to Paris, Texas to Joe Hoskins house to pick up Choppa. While we were there Joe showed some interest in matching Betty Joe again. Joe had cancer and knew he was going to die. He was very sick and did not travel very far from home at that time. So I offered to rent Betty Joe for a match. He liked the idea. So we agreed that I would give him $500 for the use of Betty Joe in a match of my choosing. Joe needed money and could not get involved with the crazy stuff I was likely to pull. He had a family to feed and that is why he had started to sell off his dogs. I asked what her weight was. He said it was 38 pounds we shook hands and I paid him. Well while we had been talking and making our deals, my buddy Timmy had seen Banjo and had been playing with him. At some point he had asked Joe if Banjo was for sale. Joe told him he could have Banjo for $100 because he was only 9 months old. So Timmy hit me up that we should buy Banjo. I told him I was not interested in that dog because his daddy's mama was a man biter, which I can't stand, and his daddy was a cur that had quit on all fours and was in no danger of dying, just two weeks or so earlier. I saw the video, and Sack was a cur. Well Timmy didn't really understand what a gamble buying a dog right off a cur was, or how low the odds were that such a dog could turn out. I did not know how exceptional a dog that Betty Jo was. I wouldn't have been as worried about a dog off her and the son of McCool's bully and her sister if I had. Well we had a bit of a discussion about the wisdom of this purchase. But he was real hard headed about it, and brought up the fact that he had put in $200 on a grown dog that wouldn't fight. I had to give in. So I offered Joe $50 for the pup and he said yes. So we shook hands and paid up and loaded up. Timmy was living with me and Terry. So I told him Banjo would be his responsibility. I didn't have time to fool with that dog and would be busy with the keep and schooling these other dogs. He said no problem. And he did his part. Banjo and Tim got to be good friends. Timmy would go out every day and take care of Banjo, and play with him and take him for long walks. And I didn't give him much thought. I wasn't having much luck getting Choppa started, but I liked Slapjack so much I wasn't about to give up on Choppa very easy. I got Betty Jo hooked into a 2XW out of Louisiana. And we settled in for the long haul. I matched her at 38 pounds like Jo said for $1000 on the front money with a $500 forfeit. Well when I picked up Betty Jo a week before the match. She looked real good, Jo had. Done a fine job on the keep. Jo Hoskins was a solid dog man, he had been around for years. He was not known around very well but he was known very well by those that had been around. I was a little concerned about her weight. And as the week went on that concern was well founded. It was obvious that she was a 37 pounds dog by Thursday. It was already getting hot and I am not bringing in a dog heavy on a warm humid night in Louisiana. So Timmy and I hit the road and we met a W. McCool in mine in Louisiana. Of course Joe couldn't make it. Let me make something very clear here. McCool and Hoskins were good friends, and just as any good friends do in the dog game, they were involved in each other's breeding and matches. I bought dogs from McCool and I bought dogs from Joe Hoskins. But I am not never bought a dog from Joe and Tony. 
Joe never had to call Tony when I was making a deal with him. Neither did Tony have to call Joe when I was making a deal with him. Tony never owned Banjo or BB Red one day of their life. He owned their daddy and that was it, period. I give credit where credit is due. Joe was the seasoned veteran and was Tony's mentor as far as the dogs go. Tony was a young man just as I was, and he has done a lot since then, but he was a minor player in the deals I made with Joe. So anyway, Betty Joe hit the scales at just under 37 pounds and then we got a break. The other bitch came in way heavy at 41 and a half pounds while I collected the $500. And was firmly in control. A position I always wanted to be in. They was going for their championship and it was a big show with a lot of people. So they was wanting this certificate real bad. I guess she had been shown at that same spot in front of the same people before that in her other matches. She had finished them quickly. So I told them I would be willing to look at it for 4 to 1 knots. I would only bet back their 500 to 2000. As Betty Jo was not my dog and the owner was not there to talk to about it. And I wouldn't kill his dog just for money. But I was willing to gamble the forfeit for a chance. So the match went on. By the time we got them washed and in the pit the side bets was 2 to 1 against us. That big chocolate bitch ran over Betty like a freight train, buried up in her stifle and stayed there. And the side bet promptly went to 4 to 1. I was a little concerned and waited for 15 minutes or so to decide what I was seeing. If that bitch would have let go of that stifle and switched to the other one at any time in the first 40 minutes she would have killed us. Because Betty Jo could not have defended herself grippled in both stifles. But she didn't tee. She just stayed there rooting in deeper and deeper on that same leg, up high in the meat. And though she had crippled that leg, she had not opened of any arteries and we had lost very little blood. And Betty Jo was fighting her ass off from the bottom and about the 20 minutes mark I decided we would stay for the long haul. And I started putting my money where my heart was. At 4 to 1 I would make plenty of money to compensate told Joe if I had to kill his bitch to win. And I could already see that she was going to win, but I thought it would probably kill her to do it. So I got about another $3,000 bet at 4 to 1 over the next 25 minutes then when all my money was bet something amazing happened. That neither I nor anyone else that had been watching. That match ever dreamed could happen that far into a hard match on a hot night. Betty Jo quit trying to get a leg or a shoulder, and reached around and bit that monster on the top of the snout and broke high tea from the middle of the front teeth to the back ok the jaw. The whole side of that snout was broke off and just swinging, and that bitch came out of that stifle unable to defend herself. I had called a turn on Betty Jo a long time ago when she was on her back and the ref's back was turned. Lomau which he promptly gave me. There is a lot to winning a match besides having a good dog. And I know it all. So anyway, they are as ready to handle as I am. We get a handle and I see that bitch is finished. When I scratch Betty Jo she goes over on three legs and snaps that chocolate bitch's front leg and compound fractures it, that's when the bone is sticking out of the meat. Woo oo oo oo. Ha oo oo oo. That bitch cured to the bone. Headed for the wall, but Betty Jo wouldn't let her out. She exited stage left on the next scratch, over the wall. At about 15 months old I matched Banjo into Wilson's Wolfie. Wilson was a made man in the cartel from the Monte Texas under the tutelage of James Creel and Robert Kirkland. Their number one prodigy. And Wolfie was from the cream of the crop, top of the line breed Creel dogs. A litter mate to Kirkland's Susie a good little bitch that feel quickly to be be read later, when they came for their revenge and pulled out their biggest gun Robert Kirkland. He was also a litter mate to the dog that went 302 with Dugan's champion Moon. I want to say something here before I go on. It is rumored by the misinformed that I picked my shots with Banjo and BB Red. And that is true. I picked the best dog men and dogs I could find. Wilson and Wolfie was fast lane competition from the game Dog Dynasty, the Creel family. A complete suicide mission for the average guy with a 17 month old dog. That hasn't even started yet. I lined the match up on a night that a big event was taking place in North Louisiana. One that would draw everybody. 
Then we went south to Creel's backyard. Literally. Me, Timothy Hanna, yes we made up before we had to go to court on the accidental wreck we had. And another good friend of mine Tim Lackey. Three people from my side. And the Creel cartel. And everybody else was busy in North Louisiana. If I brought out a monster, I tried to do it quietly. You can't make no money crowing cockadoodledo and beating your chest. Most men do that because they are trying to scare off everybody. Like a cur dog, barking and bristling up their fur. Because really they don't want no trouble. But if you ever seen a dog that really wants to get a hold of something, he lays back and gets real quiet, like a lion before he springs out to get your ass. So if I was picking my shots I guess I'm guilty. So anyway we went into their backyard. Wolfie had to cross the pit and take hold of Banjo. Banjo was a little slow to get going. And Wolfie got a hold on Banjo's front right paw and broke his two middle toes. That was the only serious injury Banjo ever sustained in five fast lane. Matches. It was a lesson he never forgot and the reason you will see him holding up that front right paw in many of his pictures. Now whoever knew, much less told that part of the story? Like I said, I'm the only one who can tell this story. So Wolfie worked that paw pretty good, for a long time. It took that puppy a little while to figure out what to do. But when he got loose, it would be the last time a dog ever got a serious hold on him again until the last fight. But I noticed something I liked after that. It was a trait that he would show every time, in all his matches. He would spin his tail in a clockwise circle. Faster and faster as the fight went on until I would think his ass was going to hover off the ground. And that was about the time he would kill them. He wore Wolfie down on the head. Then when Wolfie stumbled he went to the shoulder and it was over. 45 minutes. It was as long as he would ever go. I took him home. BB Red was matched in her first match. She came in heat a few days later. Two weeks later and two weeks before her. Match. I bred her to Banjo. She won her match, we got busted. Two weeks later I was taking some money to our lawyer. I didn't get caught. But I was the one who had hosted the matches. Most of the people who had been busted was from way out of town. So I did all the leg work and managed the case for everyone. They all walked. Nobody has ever done any time behind me. If I got someone into something I got them out. Anyway, my lawyer just brought up the fact that they had three dogs in custody. It was me and Timmy in a pickup that day. When we left, I told. Timmy let's go by the dog pound and see if that is where they are holding my dogs, because I want that bitch back. He said, how are you going to get her back? If she is even there. I said, with a shotgun and a ski mask if that's what it takes. And I was as serious as hell. We pulled up to the building. And I told Timmy to pull up beside of the building headed toward the street just in case we catch a break. There was a fence around the back, with a gate we parked right. Beside of. We walked around the front of the building and right in the front door. There was no one at the desk. And all the dogs were raising hell. You couldn't hear yourself think. We went into the holding area. We never come face to face, or even saw anyone. I came to a door that said no admittance, vicious dogs. I said that is us. We went out the door and turned to the right and was looking at the gate that we were parked by. And between us and that gate was all three. Dogs, one right after the other one. And BB Red was in the last pin. No locks. I grabbed BB and we were off. Timmy was upside down in the seat of that truck laughing as hard as I ever seen a man laugh in my life. He was saying, this shit isn't real. Things don't happen like this in real life. I can't believe we just walked in there and took this bitch back. That crazy as hell. Stuff like. That happened to me all the time. Just in case it hasn't dawned on you yet. It was destiny, my whole life with the dogs was. I'm not trying to take credit for things like this. Shit just happened. It was like a wild roller coaster ride. I just went with it most of the time. Most people were just too scared to get on. She had three puppies. I'll talk about them later. The most important thing I found out from Banjo's first match was that he didn't travel well. 
he suffered from severe motion sickness. He would stand at his box and dry heave all the way. He would arrive weak and dehydrated. The rest of his matches I would arrive three days early, all except for one that is. So anyway we matched into Anderson's slick a Kinnard bred dog. It was really a not event. It took 29 minutes because Banjo didn't start for 25 minutes. He never really got excited. Come to find out neither Tony or that Kinnard dog had any heart. And he picked him up quick. I was really disappointed. And I was very unimpressed with all them bid. Time dog men and dogs that was supposed to be the shit from Oklahoma. Grand champion Slickhead, Count Pierre, and the seven time winner Heavy Duty. I though the whole lot was a bunch of overblown bullshit. I mean they was all decent dogs. But not nearly worth all that hype. I saw four of the matches between the three dogs I have mentioned. It was the same story every time. Some drunk bum would show up with a thrifty nickel special. For $300 and they would run through him like a dose of salt. So what? I set my sights on all of them. Harold Parsons matched into Betty Jo, then Bobby Smith found out what was happening and dropped a dime on me. And they squirreled out of the match halfway in. That is how I ended up matched into Mean Jolene, at 41. I had no respect for any dog or dog man from Oklahoma. Except for Steve Standafford. He didn't run with a regular click and he was honest, and had heart. And that cost him. I eventually got heavy duty. But I had to use Big O and his tank dog to do it. After the show Betty Jo put on. They wouldn't even answer my phone calls after that. It's a shame to curt a bunch of big time dog men with a bitch that loses. Then came grunt and foolish pride. Let me say first that Steve was at a big disadvantage from the beginning in this match. He didn't see either of Banjo's first two matches. I saw both of Grunt's. I thought Grunt was a worthy dog. I was very impressed with his two wins. But I also thought he was a 33 pounds dog. And he was he was too small for Banjo and I knew it. And I told Steve that. I liked Steve, I thought he was a real good guy. I also thought that it was too early in both dogs carrier to run them into. Each other. There was still plenty of competition out there that hadn't yet heard about either of these dogs and if we moved quickly we might still get a couple of more matches apiece. Of course Steve totally misread all of this as I was afraid of Grunt. And there was also a little matter of money. I wanted to match for 5,010,000 dollars. And of course he took that as more evidence that I was scared. Because I knew that was way out of his league. If he would have listened to me and waited he could have been in the match for the grand championship for $500 or hell for free. It wasn't money that I was after. But I got to make money too. Anyway he finally pissed me off one day. And I told him okay. Since you want it so bad, you do what I do when I'm gunning for someone meet all my demands. You come to me. Right to my backyard. Fight for $2000 on the front money because I saw you match a bitch a month ago for $2,000. And I want all your side bets. Well to add insult to injury. Steve got thrown into jail the week of the match. I tried to let them out. But he had said too much to too many, and his pride wouldn't let him do the right thing. So he sent his wife and 16 year old son with the dog and instructions not to pick up under any circumstances. I would have done the same thing. That don't mean I enjoyed it. It left a bad taste in my mouth. I did everything I could to help them that night. I treated them like they was my wife and son. And obliged them in every way I could. But it didn't matter. Banjo was starting to get salty about that time. And a hard charging ball of fire like Grunt who was all business and no foolishness was just what the doctor ordered. And it was a big crowd at home. I swear the dog was as big a show off as I was. And he rose to the occasion in style. It was a total massacre. Grunt never had a chance, he never made a mistake. So Banjo stayed on that head the whole time. Banjo didn't fight the ear. Banjo fought the meat that held the ear. He bit Grunt so hard when he got that tail twirling that he busted Grunt's inner rear. Those of you that seen the video, will notice that Grunt suddenly went loop-legged late in the fight went to stumbling around like a drunk. 
I saw it many times when I would punch a man directly in his ear. You bust. That inner eardrum they lose balance and get drunk. It causes spaghetti legs. And if you are fighting a man or a dog like Banjo, spaghetti legs causes death. The next morning Banjo had the second worst injury he would ever sustain in any of his fights. The skin under his neck was hanging loose a couple of inches. Because that was the only thing Grunt ever got his mouth on. I bred Banjo to a female that day just like I did the day after every one of his other matches. I fought BB Red with puppies two weeks in her bellied wise. Won the match and delivered the puppies both times. We was moving pretty fast about that time. Four in a row. Banjo's win over two times winner Grunt was the kickoff event that started one of the greatest, if not the greatest runs in Bulldog history. Of course I am biased. But I've never heard of any story even close. Two weeks later I took little sister Freebie to South Mississippi for her championship match against Sando's champion Bertha. It was the biggest show I was ever involved with. Over 500. People were at that event. Eight matches in a row. Harvey M sponsored the event. Danny Burton won the first match with a male. Freebie and Bertha was the second card event. Well everybody but me knew that Bertha had destroyed her first three opponents quickly. And Bertha was a heavy favorite by the time we got in the pit. I found out why quickly. When we pitted them, Bertha came across like a rocket and hit Freebie in the left shoulder and wrecked it. You could hear stuff popping deep inside that shoulder, and Freebie started whining. Now I knew Freebie was a very game dog because I had tested her with BB Red. She is the only dog that ever went more than 40 minutes with BB and lived. And when you were biting hard enough to make a game dog whine, you are doing some serious damage. I knew we were in trouble. Of course the crowd went wild. They had all expected Bertha to win. They had to be a little reserved because it was me. And not too many people that far to the east knew anything about Free B. But now it appeared I had brought a cur. At least to the untrained ear. When a dog whines there is a certain pitch to it. Different dogs will whine for different reasons. Most people ain't never been around or paid enough attention to be able to discern which one they are hearing. Those people assume it's always a sign of a dog that is about to quit. I always make a lot of money when they are wrong. Some dogs will whine out of frustration because they are mad as hell and for whatever reason they can't get their mouth on the other dog. Champion Nemel and BB Red would whine if you held them in the corner too long on a scratch. Because they wanted that other dog so bad they couldn't stand it. Neither of them certainly was not a cur. And even the deep game dog will whine if you are biting them hard enough to break shoulders and legs. So they thought it would soon be over. And for all I knew that bitch was going to open up an artery or switch shoulders, which in neither case meant we was through. Well about that time some little jack off that was sitting right up pitch side started hollering, hey cowboy bet me $50. Now he ain't opened his mouth until he heard that shoulder breaking. And I tried to ignore him for a long time. But he wouldn't shut up. And Freebie needed all my attention. I needed a turn back. So I keep telling him no thank you I got all my money bet. His mouth got smarter and smarter until I snapped. I said look fella, I got $6,800 bet in the middle. And I did my betting before the match started. And now I'm getting killed. Isn't that good enough for you? He said well hell big money man. Another $50 dollars isn't shit to a higher oler like you. I said, you're right, 50 dollars ain't shit. So bet $500 or shut the fuck up. So he bet the 500 And then he shut the fuck up. Because he knew that if he opened his mouth again I'd make him bet another $500, or make them remove his ass out of my sight. Because I was ready to slap him in his cocksucker the next time he opened it. Well about that time Freebie got loose and Bertha would never get her mouth on Freebie again the rest of the fight. But Bertha was still coming with a vengeance. Hard and fast. Freebie was the second most talented head dog I ever saw behind Banjo. She had one other thing in common with him that the crowd didn't know. About. But about the 40 minute mark Bertha made her first and last mistake. Those bitches hadn't took a deep breath. 
it had been a total blur up till that mark. Right around the 40 minute mark Bertha slipped and went down to the floor. Little sister let go of that head curled up her back like a timber rattler and struck Bertha in the left stifle. Shook her head once and returned to her original hold on the side of Bertha's head. Look at he split if you wasn't looking right at them, you missed it. But not the results. Bertha was leaking on the outside of that leg. Opened up an artery and blood was spraying up in the air about 5 foot. Opened up an artery inside the leg and a puddle of blood come spreading out under her like a blanket. I thought Santu's fat ass was going to kill over with a heart attack. I look over at Big Mouth and he was green in the face. Well now. And the crowd was sitting in stunned silence. I mean you could have heard a pin drop. Just one minute earlier you couldn't hear yourself think. But all their shit talking had drowned each other out. But not mine. And for the next hour I introduced them folks to some good old East Texas get back. I usually make several mental notes about what all the geniuses think in the beginning. Hunting ain't no fun when the rabbit gets the gun. LOL. I punished those people. Oh I was in rare form too. Especially my $50 buddy. That punk had to dig the last 10 of my $500 out from under his seats and ashtray and change. I kept it in a can for years after that. I would laugh my ass off every time I saw it. When it was over me and Howard loaded little sister in the van and headed for the motel. She was in bad shape. If I wanted to watch dogs fight, I had 100 good ones on the chain at the house. Helmy and Howard saw some of the best dog fighting that was to be seen on a regular basis in my backyard drinking some cold beer, and didn't have to listen to no geniuses while we was doing it. The next morning H. Miller called me and asked if he could come by before we left. I said sure, I wanted to buy that old sweet news bitch he had so I wanted to make an offer. Well when he got there, he had his hate in his hand, so to speak. I asked him what was wrong. He said, Koi I'm sorry them son of a bitches didn't give you the best in show, or at least gamest in show. I picked those three guys. To be judges cause they was known and supposed to be respectable dog men. And I wanted everything to be above board. The decision they made was crazy. I laughed. He said Koi I'm going down Monday and have you a special plate twice as nice and twice as expensive as that worthless trophy they gave away. I am so embarrassed. Please accept my apology. You see they had given both to Danny Burton. The only other fight I did see. It was a lackluster fight. And Danny's dog was some overpriced pile of shit that some rich boy had paid a ton of money for. And they gave the trophies to Danny. Because he was everybody's hero. I have over 200 professional fights to my record. Have pitted numerous aces and so many dead game dogs no one can remember them all and I never received not one trophy. And I'm glad, because I'm pretty sure that it takes a lot of toothpaste to scrub the taste of dick out of your mouth. So I told Harvey, if that is how you really feel, then sell me that sweet news bitch at a fair price. And that will be reward enough for me. I never seen a trophy produce a game dog. So he did. So I went home happy and rich. A bunch of dead presidents make for good trophy material. Two weeks after that we went to Southeast Texas. Where BB Red won her championship match against the Bullions Club champion Gizmo. BB totally destroyed Gizmo. The picture of me and BB and Robert Kirkland was taken right after that match. Two weeks after that we went back to Mississippi. North Mississippi this time to the second biggest event I was ever involved in. That was the night Roadblocks champion Joey beat Grand Champion Texas and Kirkland. We was the second card. It was mine and Mike Lloyd's Dino going for his championship against champion Smokey. I had bought a half interest in the Dino dog after I matched him for Mike for his second win. Falls had conditioned and handled for Mike in the first match. And Dino was down off of Ronnie Duhin's stuff and a son of that champion Moon Dog. Mike had heard himself working offshore a few years before that, and had got a little money. He bought some good dogs at that time. But he didn't know anything about conditioning or handling or feeding. And when his money ran out his old lady left him and took everything except the dogs. 
and of course all his good bulldog buddies dropped him too. Except when they came by to try and beat him out of some of the dogs he had left. I met Mike because he had that Cajun dog, because the crack dealer that bought him from Mike Thiba Docks had abandoned him for dead after the seventh off the chain win against Mike Lloyd. Mike was firmly in the Pistol Pete and Boomerang camp. And old Cajun was just out there growing old for nothing going to waste. So when I heard the dog might be there, I called Mike and got the old dog for a pound of Mexican commercial. Well Mike had hooked up with Tina by that time. And baby girl was my kind of hustler. So they started working for me, and we became friends and I started helping Mike recoup some of his money that he had invested in the dogs. In the dog game some people are your friends because of the money. And some people are your friends and fuck the money. So anyway, me and Mike was partners on Dina by this time. Mike and Robert Kirkland hated each other. I told Mike that Dino could win over Grand Champion Texas. And that I would buy a controlling interest in Dino if he wanted to make him famous, take my money, get in the car and ride. Of course that was too simple. I had a good working relationship with Robert based on mutual respect. I had matched several dogs into the Creole dynasty and had managed to keep our relationship civil. Something that was very rare with that group of individuals. Cause they was a very disrespectful bunch of people. Especially. At home. But I liked Robert. He was the finest conditioner and handler I ever faced or saw go. So Mike goes home and calls Robert on the phone. Challenges Texas and does it very rudely. And starts a lot of drama. Not my style at all. It's hard enough to keep a killing from happening when the drama don't get started until the night of the fight. But if you start at 3 months out it's almost impossible to avoid violence at some point. Especially with my crew in that one. But. I was already locked in before I even got the phone call. Mike didn't have the money to do it himself even if I would have bowed out. I always back a friend's play. Even if it's wrong and I'm mad as hell. Always. So it went the way it went, just like I knew it would. In less than a month and it was already out of hand. Then one day I got a call from Robert Kirkland. He said that Roadblock had been talking shit about Texas and accusing him of ducking champion Joey etc etc and asked if there was any way we could postpone our match. So that he could go after Joey first. He didn't want to offend me or make me think he was ducking me either for a softer spot. Said he would pay the forfeit and promise us a match for Dino with another champion if Texas didn't make it. It was perfect. No I had control of my match back. And I made it very clear to Mike it better not happen again. You can't match dogs on foolish pride. So I told Robert, if the dogs in Michigan are that good. Surly they got two champions. And if they get me a match the same night against a good proven champion. I don't need a forfeit. I'd rather have the match. And we can postpone our business until a later date. So that is how I ended up in the match with Champion Dino and Champion Smokey. And just as I knew it was going to happen. There was a lot of drama during the Texas and Joey match. I mean with the people. I had seen Texas fight twice before. That is how I knew that Dino would whip him. Texas was a typical Creole dog. Pit game hang around and if you don't put some punishment on him. Robert's conditioning and handling is going to beat you down the stretch. Joey was a little better dog than that. But way overrated. I believe that Champion Smokey would have beat Texas or Joey that same night. Dino and Smokey went 248 and was both dead game. Smokey was a very talented head dog that Dino could not catch until 145. I mean we never had a bite on him at all. And Dino was not a smart dog at all. He charged straight ahead as hard as he could that whole time desperately trying to get a hold. I thought surly he would run himself into the ground at that pace and old Smokey just ridding him around in circles like a cheap cutting horse. Well it was Smokey that got run into the ground. At 1.45 Dino finally ran him into the corner. Got him in the back stifle high up and crippled him. That was the end of the fancy running. For the next hour and three minutes we got down in the mud and the blood and the beer baby. It was a hell of a fight. Several scratches from both dogs. Smokey was very game and Dino was just in a little better shape. So Dino won and they both gave up the ghost for their effort. 
four championship matches two weeks apart. And several thousand miles of traveling. We beat three fast lane champions and a two times winner that would have been a champion if he would have fought any other dog. All four opponents took their death not one cur in the bunch. And one of mine paid the ultimate price for a victory. And we won all four. Now if you know a better story than that one? I'd like to hear it. Bobby Smith put me in like Antina and Banjo, and BB Red, and Little Sister Freebie, and Dino on the cover of Face Your Dogs magazine the next issue. War Paint. I don't remember how the match got started. But I do remember everything else. After I found out about Vito I was very interested in doing the fight. Vito was a four times winner and was the hottest jeep dog alive at the time. I believe Bobby Smith and Bob Boyd was the main go but wins. The match was to be at Barry Walston's place in North Louisiana. The purse was $5,000 with a $2,500 forfeit. On a gentleman's agreement. That means we trusted each other to do the right thing, and no money was actually put up. I had as many as six dogs match at one time and continuously had three matched at any given time. I could not keep that kind of cash tied up all the time. I had to trust people. I never gave anybody one valid reason not to trust me. So the match was set for 60 days out. Right in the middle of summer. Well right away Willard started calling me every day. I mean every day. Sometimes two or three times a day if he could catch me. He. Would tell me how bad old Vito had beat the first four dogs. How he was breeding him to two or three bitches a week so he was losing money doing this match. I would think to myself you are going to lose a lot more. And how typical that program was for a jeep dog. When you were going to make a jeep dog a famous stud dog, you need to breed him hundreds of times and produce thousands of puppies. And spend lots of time on the phone doing self promotion. I would just tell. Old Willard thank you for giving me a chance at such a good dog. How honored I was to have this opportunity. The more smoke I blew up his ass the bigger his head got. And the more belligerent his arrogance became. I thought, wow, this is it. I'm going to make a lot of money. I'm actually going to be the underdog. Against the best jeep dog in the country. I would get a woody just thinking about it. Well about two weeks out the phone went dead. I asked my wife Terry, has the guy from Mississippi been calling for me? She said no. He must have died or something. Well the next day Bobby Smith called me telling me how Boyd had been calling everybody telling them that Willard had the FBI and the CIA and the KKK all over his ass. It was quite a story. Murder drugs and all other kinds of stuff was going on and everybody was scared to death. Barry had called off the show. And we would have to make other arrangements. I started laughing. I told him, they heard about Banjo and are running up a smoke screen. He said the police are all over him coy. I said, they better put up a roadblock in front of his house if they want to save that red dog. Bobby said, you're going to Mississippi after hearing all this. I said, I'm going any place I have to. I have endured two months of daily bullshit and disrespect. And those cur son of a bitches aren't getting out of this with some boogeyman story. He said, what do you want me to tell them? I said, you tell them I will come to Willard's daddy's house. They can move the couch out of the living room and put up any size pit that will fit. Two men to a dog. And any referee they want. Or any other place or conditions they choose. Or tell them to pay me and admit that they are some cur son of a bitches. Well they knew that Bobby Smith would have printed that word for word in the next issue of Face Your Dogs. That would have been real bad for puppy cells. So when the day came. I headed out to Mississippi. Something had happened and I didn't get to leave until the day before the match. Which was a Friday. I took my good friend Howard Nip. Him and Mike Lloyd and Tina Mike's old lady and John Roach. Were the only ones that had the balls to go by match time. When we got over to Alexandria, la. My alternator went out. It was already late. So I got a room, we was about halfway to where they had told us to go. No shops open. So Mike had to get some guy out of bed at a wrecking yard for an alternator. And some spun out dumbass to put it on. It took all night. 
Early the next morning we took off. Remember what I told you about Banjo's car sickness? Everything that could go wrong did go wrong. We got to the motel they had told us to go to. I ran the 144 ounces of water and beef broth through Banjo's stomach from 12 noon to 3 p.m. A bad idea any time. But a horrible one in the heat. But going in dehydrated is even worse. Well finally Bob Boyd showed up and took us on a tour of Mississippi. Two and a half hours after we took off we finally met up with Willard and Vito. And off we went again. After about 20 minutes Bob Boyd took a sudden right turn out of the line on a side road. My buddy Howard said, Hey Koi isn't that the guy we've been following all day? Where is he going? I said, I don't know Howard. But that red dog we come to Mississippi to kill is in that black suburban in front of us. He laughed. Well another 20 minutes down the road we turned down a country road, and a little further down a dirt path. Then up to a spot where several cars were parked. Willard jumped out of his truck hollering, where is Bob? I said, you've seen Bob turn 30 miles back just like I did. Cut the bullshit, and let's do this. But Bob had half the money. I just shook my head. Remember the forfeit money was $2,500. They thought I would just take the $2,500 and go home. And Bob would take one for the team. But puppy prices and stud fees would hold their value and they would be back in business. I said who is the ref? Some guy I didn't know stepped forward. I said I want to weigh them. Willard got a strange look on his face. The ref ordered him to weigh Vito. He was almost a pound heavy. Banjo was a half of a pound light. Then I turned to the ref and said. They are heavy, they don't have the money. So this is what we are going to do. You collect all the money Willard has on him. I want the change out of his pockets and his ashtray. Then I want to wash that red dog and put him in the pit. Because I didn't come to Mississippi to collect a forfeit. I come to kill that red son of a bitch. And if they want to save him they are going to have to cur out in front of God and all these good folks. And admit that they are some scarred curs. Then I turned and looked right at old Willard. Poppy cells just went back in the toilet. Lmao. Well, so we got them in the pit. Vito shot over and Banjo caught him coming in. Banjo started fast and was in full control. Vito was charging hard and was taken off his feet real early. Something that hadn't happened in his first three matches. And just as he always did. Banjo went to the shoulder and made Vito pay dearly for the mistake. When Vito got back on his feet he was crippled in his shoulder and bleeding the dark thick blood. Inside and outside of the shoulder. It wasn't long before he slipped again and Banjo promptly took out the other shoulder. After that he stayed down more than he stayed up. And they started talking about picking up. A quick pick up, and a courtesy scratch, and puppy cells could be salvaged a little. A live loser will make more money than a dead hero. I think they might have saved him if they would have picked up when they first started talking about it. Then about that time Banjo blew up hot. I mean hot as hell. Looked like he was going to fall out. Well they got all excited, and let me call a funky turn. Let me say this. It was my practice in every match I had to start calling turns as soon. As a match got underway. A turn on their dog, a turn on my dog. A turn when the ref was looking the other way talking and couldn't be sure what had happened. I didn't care who the turn was on. I just wanted one. And they will usually give you one quick on your own dog. I can't affect the fight until I can lay my hands on the dog. Then I can take control of the pace. Anyway that being said. I never saw Banjo, BB Red, and Slapjack, Betty Joan or any of her puppies ever made an honest turn. Very few of my dogs that I called and got a turn on ever made a real turn. And this was a good example. If I hadn't got the handle started. And if they hadn't been so willing to help me, I might have been in some big trouble. A bad heat spell can disorient the dog so he don't know what is going on. But we got six quick handles. And they was throwing me big sponges of cool filled water. You can't have a fast race car without a hot engine. You use water to keep that engine from blowing up. Works like a charm. The last time I handled Banjo's tongue. Was in his mouth, 
The heat spell was over and so was Vito's life, Banjo went over and was finishing him quick. By the time it dawned on Willard and them it was too late. They picked up Vito and when they faced him for a courtesy scratch blood was running down both front legs like a waterfall. You can't stop that. It's like someone taking a razor and cutting open their arteries from their armpits to their elbows. I put a collar on Banjo and he jumped over the wall and drugged me to the car. It was T-Bone steak and a girlfriend time and he knew it. Vito died. On the way to the truck. A man came up to me and said, Texas Iron Man I got something I want you to see. I said okay. He started unbuttoning the front of his shirt. He opened up that shirt and showed me a row of very fresh staples going down the center of his chest. Holding together a cut that was still leaking and oozing. He said, I had a triple bypass a few days ago. They wouldn't let me out of the hospital said I could die. But I heard that red dog coming from Texas was the best dog that ever walked on four legs. So I told my wife to get the car running and I snuck out this morning. And I am not disappointed. Everything I heard about that little dog was true. I'd like to shake your hand and pet that dog one time if you don't mind. And if I die on the way back to the hospital you can know I died happy. Because I got to see the best fighting dog that ever lived go. Every now and then you get to interact with a quality man. It was those times that did it for me. I'd go through a hundred piles like Willard Rivers for one chance to meet Amon like that. Sunny Days in South Texas We went down to South Texas for the last one. The main reason I took the match is because I couldn't get another one. He was open to the world. No money was too big. Whatever, whenever, wherever. Not only could I not find a match for Banjo, but he was killing all my action from 34 to 40 pounds. And I was setting on several young up and coming dogs at that time. So finally Mark Davis started telling me that Raul had a two time winner. And wanted a shot. I liked Raul he was a businessman and honest and fair minded. I knew there wouldn't be any drama or bullshit. And the money would be good. So I took the match and agreed to travel to them. I took my old buddy Jimmy Mayfield. We went down three days early and got in a nice and comfortable motel. Out of the way and a great spot to be with a bulldog. Banjo was the perfect dog to take if you wanted to lay low and not draw any attention to yourself. Cool and laid back as they come. Never got upset. Never got excited about anything but a horse. He hated horses and would lose his mind if he saw one. But outside of that, I never seen him lose his cool about anything as stable and calm as they come. By Friday afternoon everybody else started coming. In. We had that entire motel booked from Friday until Monday morning. And the party was on. Everybody I knew brought a woman for me. It's good to be king. LOL. By Saturday noon there was chest full of beer stacked in every room, lines of cocaine on every mirror. And half naked girls running everywhere. It was showtime. I was on autopilot. Me and Banjo really put on a spectacle. I wore a pair of $750 ostrich cowboy boots, a $200 cowboy hat, and a $400 black leather jacket to handle in. When the match was over they handed me a collar and a lead rope that I put on Banjo. And he walked himself to the box. I took a wet rag and wiped my hands and was ready to go to the club. Banjo would have been ready also. But he had to wash off Sonny's blood off first. Oh, I better tell you about the match. Sonny might have been the best dog Banjo ever faced. Bad part for Sonny was that by the time he got to Banjo, Banjo was the best dog that ever lived. Sonny was the only dog that ever had to face a grown and mature Banjo. I don't know how good Banjo really was. Because he was just starting to come into his own in this match. He wasn't even three years old yet. But Sonny did something that no other dog ever did. He put Banjo on his back. Not for long. But he did it, and not only that. But he also got into Banjo's stifle. That got Banjo's attention and got Sonny killed. Banjo reached around and took old Sonny by the side of the head and pulled him off and stood up with power and force. His tail was spinning like a helicopter blade. I thought his ass was going to lift off the ground. No. Defense after that. 
He didn't wait for Sonny to make a mistake or wear him down like he usually did. He just overpowered Sonny and went to killing him. He was doing some terrible stuff to Sonny's chest. Sonny was leaking that old thick liver colored blood out of some holes that looked like he had been shot with Hank Jr.'s old Colt 45. I thought you ain't living long like this. Banjo kept Sonny balled up pretty good, and I was hovering over them pretty close. I didn't want to miss nothing. I guess down inside I knew nobody else was going to be dumb enough to feed their dog and money to this monster after this spectacle. It took Raul a little while to figure out what was really happening. This was the first time Banjo went to work like this this early. But when he snapped too. They picked up. I won $500 on Sonny's courtesy scratch against Mark Davis. It was one of the gamest scratches I ever saw. He went down in the front end twice and rolled completely over once and still finished that scratch. I tried to buy him after the match. Even though I didn't believe he could live. But it would have been worth the gamble. At the time I heard he died. Someone told me recently that he had lived after that match. I doubt it, but you can't be sure. Well after that the phone went dead. I mean graveyard dead. Nobody was returning my calls. Then I started hearing about the great Andy Cap dog. It took me a while but I finally got a number on an old boy that owned that dog. So I called our hall on the phone. At first he acted like he was interested. I told him I would give him a pound, Andy Cap at 37 and Banjo at 36. Which actually means I was giving him two pounds because Banjo was always a 35 pounds dog. He would have to do most of the traveling and meet me in North Louisiana at Barry's place. Which was just like being home to me. Actually better, because I wouldn't have to worry about anything but Banjo at Barry's. I would pay all the expenses. First class all the way. Women and wine. I was basically willing to give him the same deal I was offering LG. I told Del Green in front of many witnesses, several times. That I would pay him cash money up front. To put Grand Champion Teen against BB Red. All he had to agree to was that they would be left in the pit until one dog could not or would not scratch. LG was a cur. And I can't swear Hall was as rank as LG was, because. I never got a chance to disrespect him in front of 8100 people like I did Del G. But I do know this. The sweeter I made the deal the harder it was to get Hall on the phone. He wasn't saying he wouldn't do. He just wouldn't agree on a forfeit in a date. He just keep dragging it out. This went on for months. Now the last three chapters including this one. Are all overlapping events. They all happened at the start of and over the course of the summer of 1992. I got busted on a 10 pounds delivery marijuana charge. I lost a lot of money. And had to pay some big lawyer and bondsman fees. They was stealing two or three dogs a week from me. And whole litters at a time. Tony Irichika set me up with John Smith and stole the whole litter off of my CH. Leroy Brown dog to BB Red. I didn't know it was him until years later thank goodness. Big O came and picked up his pup that I had given him at 4 weeks old. Before they was ready to go. It didn't make any sense at the time. But now I know it was because he knew what they was going to do. And they was supposed to be my friends. Of course nobody but my friends knew where I lived. So in one way or another I knew every time a dog come up missing someone I liked had something to do with it. I didn't do business with the public at large. I had the dogs I wanted to use in breedings. And let the men I like breed their dogs to any of mine for free. But it was getting hard to not offend people when. They are asking to breed. So I took out another ad. Open to public stud. Koi's Grand Champion Banjo $3,500. Koi's Champion Leroy Brown $2,500. Koi's Emil to $1,500. The Emil II part was a joke on my part. I was just getting ready to break out the first of his offspring. Nobody knew anything about those dogs yet but me. LOL. That was the best deal I was offering. Bobby said the day I gave him my ad and money. I don't think you're going to get a lot of business. I said, I hope not Bobby. That's the point of the ad. 
I was trying to get people to leave me alone. I said if I wanted to get rich peddling puppies and stud service. I do like them Jeep dog owners. Open him for $500 and breed him to three bitches a day. Well him and two of his sons. Y'all ever think about it. Them prostitute yards don't turn down no comers. And I'll promise you that if three bitches show up at the same time, they all get breed. To something. Oh yes they get mounted to old famous Fido for the picture. But you can bet they get stuck to something that ain't out of sperm also. I never met one dog peddler I trusted. Especially when it comes to a dog deal. I got two phone calls. The first one was a real respectful young man. Said he was in the service. Stationed out in California somewhere. Had a nice. Breed little alligator female he wanted to breed to Banjo. Said he wanted to send me $500 to start with. And then send me $200 $300 every chance he got. And when I got all the money. He would bring his bitch as soon as he could afford the trip. I said. Well son why in the world would you do all that? I never bred Banjo to one alligator bitch. I have no idea if it's a good thing or a total waste of time. Especially when Gary and Christy Athens got that 7 times winner champion lion head open to public stud for $500. And he is the best alligator bred dog alive. And you know you like alligator dogs. So I gave him Gary's number and he called him and made the breeding I guess. I didn't care much for Gary, but liked Christy a lot, if you know what I mean. LOL. The second one was from the guy that was to buy Banjo. I was out cutting hay one day. Here come Terry carrying the phone. Waving me up toward the house. When I got the tractor up there. I said, who is it? She said some guy that said he wanted to breed three females to Banjo. I thought you might want to talk to him. I laughed. I told her to give me the phone and get me some iced tea. It was a black fella from California. Said he wanted to breed a bitch that came from Vincent Romero. I said, I don't care if she is a greyhound. The stud fee is $3,500 and I ain't interested in no puppies. I got all the puppies off Banjo bred the way I want them. He said, oh I want to pay cash and keep all the puppies. I just wanted you to know that these are quality bred females I got. I said, females. He said yes. I got one that will be ready to breed in two or three days, she has a full sister that is in heat a week behind her. And I got another female that started bleeding today. How much will you charge me to breed all three of them? I said, well let me see now. I'll breed the first one for 3500, the second one for 3500. And I won't charge you a penny extra to breed that third bitch. You have to drop them off here. And pick them up when I'm through. You have to come yourself both times. He said wow that's $10,500. I said, you add pretty well. He said, no discount? I told him the same thing I told Bobby Smith. Then he asked me if Banjo was for sale. I said sure he is. He said really, how much? I said. $15,000. He said, you didn't think about that very long. I said, now son you don't think you are the first person to ask me that are you? I got a friend named Big O offers to buy him at least once a week. I set that price a long time ago. Big O wants to give me $10,000. But I've thought about it a lot. And the dog is a very good deal for $15,000. He said, you would sell your best match dog. I said that's all I sell, is dogs that have won at least one match. And I sell them all the time. He said well I guess you'd need a deposit. Would 3000 hold him for 3 days until I get there? This is about the time I started thinking, this guy is full of shit. But I said yes it would. But it would be non refundable. He agreed. He hollered at a woman somewhere in another room. I heard her answer. He told her to get $3,000 out of the nightstand drawer and go down to the corner and send it Western Union to Texas to a man named. Then he stopped to get the right spelling of my name. I gave it to him. And he in turn gave it to the woman. He never hung that phone up. About 20 minutes later she returned with the confirmation number. He got Western Union on the three-way and I heard it. Said thank you, 
and I'll see you in three days. I hung up the phone. Terry said, that was a long phone call even for you. I would spend hours a day back then talking to Bobby Smith in Dallas, Texas. Or John Roach in Kansas City. Or some prospective opponent. She said, did he really want to breed three females to banjo? I said, he must have. He just bought him. Three days later he showed up with the rest of the money in a van, took banjo and left for California. He would call me every two or three days and ask me what I thought about this breeding or that breeding. He was always real respectful, and we had real civil talks. I wanted Banjo to do as good as he could. He called me one day and said that he had Banjo hooked for $50,000. I wasn't shocked. I knew them gangbangers did outrageous stuff like that against each other, all the time. I would hear about one for 100k or 50k or 30k etc I would do good to raise 10 myself. Said that he was going to use Romero like he usually did to condition. But Vince had advised him to put the dog back in the hands of the man that had brought him this far. If that was possible. I said, sure it was. I would take it as a great honor to be involved. He wanted to know my terms. I said you pay all my expenses. $1,000 up front. You send a driver in a van to pick me and Banjo up one week before the match. I want a return plane ticket home given to me before I get in the van. Put me and Banjo in a motel within 10 miles of the match site. Guarantee I get to bet my money on the front money. Up to $10,000. I'll bet the rest on the side. He agreed and told me he would get back to me. Well I didn't hear from him for a while after that. Then one day he called me. Didn't say anything about the match. Was kinda rude. I thought maybe he was drinking and having a bad day or something. Some guys are like that. I didn't take it too serious. But it happened a few times and I was beginning to get annoyed. Things were getting busy again now that Banjo was gone. So I wrote Banjo off. You never know what gets in a man's head. I didn't care. I had things to do. Well I was at a show in Louisiana just as a spectator. LG was there. Me and LG didn't care for each other. Actually I hated his ass. He was being a smart ass. So I called out Grand Champion Tina in front of everybody. I told LG I would pay him twice as much as his top match money. I never saw or heard him match a dog for over $300 in his life. So I was willing to pay him $600 to match Tina and to BB Red. No wait. The only thing he had to agree to. Was we would pit the dogs, and fight under Cajun rules with a neutral ref. And he had to leave her down until one dog was counted out on the scratch line. I did this several times. He refused again. But then he said, we got a 35 pounds mail open to you for any money. I knew then what had happened to my friend from California. I was mad as hell. I stomped a brand new $150 cowboy hat into the ground. I went and got in my car and drove straight back to Texas. When I got home, I called my friend. I told him I don't know who the fuck you think you're dealing with. But I ain't no dog peddling whore. And I sure ain't scared of no damn dog. Bring Banjo to 37 pounds and I will kill him for you. I was willing to fight him at 37 pounds I would bet the same $15,000 I sold him for. Don't ever threaten me with a $50 dog and a 2-bit man. Because I'll kill them both. You bought a dog. I don't buy grand. Champions. I build them in the backyard. And I kill them in the front yard. Well, that effed up his mind real bad. He didn't know what to do. But that is what you get when you hook your wagon to a $300 bum like LG Green. What a dipshit. You see I was writing this story at that time. And I couldn't think of a better ending than the Texas Iron Man killed his champion Nemo dog killing the great grand champion Banjo. Win or lose I would have preferred that ending. I had to settle with killing the asshole's carrier. I guess that will have to do. The Texas Iron Man.